Our text today is uh, from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And I'm going to read the text from the Amplified Version. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I'm going to read that one more time. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own purchased special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you know, uh, many churches used to have, and some still have, something they call an annual commitment day. Now, it was usually associated with giving, where people would commit to give a certain amount uh, annually or monthly. Uh, you know, that's, a, that's a good planning tool. But in my opinion, the only reason that churches would, can even dare to ask people to make a commitment of their lives to God is because God has already made a commitment to us. His commitment day, God's commitment day, was marked by weeping and sorrow and darkness and angry curses. During all the pain of a Roman crucifixion, God committed himself to us. So think about that. Now, our text today was directed to a people who had been scattered by the persecution of the Roman government. Uh, the writer, Peter, was giving encouragement and direction to the believers who were now living in exile. The Romans persecuted the Christian church, and so they had to flee. Uh, so Peter was writing to give encouragement and direction to those believers who were now living in exile. And in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, uh, he says, for example, in verses 1 and 2, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, uh, Cappadocia, Asia, and Penelia, uh, Pen uh, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. He was writing to exiles scattered throughout all these nations. In verse 6 of chapter 1, he says, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And in verse 17 of that same chapter, he says, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners living in fear. So he's addressing people that have been, been exiled, and he's encouraging them. In chapter 2, he writes, in verse 11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your souls. These early Christians now were living in fear, in fear for their lives. They needed to know they needed to know that God had made a commitment to them. They had, had, had to run because of the persecution, and they were living now in fear of their lives. So they needed to know that, that, that this God had made a commitment to them. They had made a, a, a statement, a declaration, so they needed now to know that God had made a commitment to them. These were people who belonged to God. In the midst of their terror and loneliness of their exile, it must now have been a great encouragement to know that they were God's own people. 
that they belong to him. They were part of his family. And the King James Version of our text translates our text this way. Some of you may have the King James Version, but here's what it reads, the way it reads in the King James Version. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, this, this translation says that people chosen by God and who God has made a commitment to are a peculiar people. And the old Latin word translated peculiar is peculium. It's spelled P-E-C-U-L-I-U-M. Now, it, that Latin word refers to property. So, a proper translation would be that these people were not an odd people, peculiar being odd, but they were people who were God's property. Now, being God's property doesn't mean that you're a slave because God is our father and not a slave master. It means that God is responsible for your protection, your life, and your well-being, and your peace, because you belong to him. He committed to you. God is still committed to his people today. Peter was writing them to let them encourage them that, to know that they belong to God. Well, God is still committed to us today. And there's a story about a, a young boy who was found on a busy street in a, in a city. Uh, he was dirty, and he was obviously lost. Uh, this guy went up to him to see if he could help, and he, when he asked the little boy who he belonged to, the little boy looked up with defiance, he was angry and hurt, and he replied, I ain't nobody's nothing. Now, we may know all kinds of pain, but we never have to experience the pain of believing that we are nobody's nothing because we are God's peculiar people. We belong to him. No matter what we go through, we belong to him. We're God's property. We're his special. We're his peculiar people. Now, some people, though, don't belong to God. To say you're God's people is to remind us. To say, for us to say we're God's people is to remind us that though some are God's people, everybody is not. Some people don't belong to him. Now, that doesn't mean that they were not created by God or that he doesn't love them. It doesn't mean that. It means, simply means, that some are not willing to come to him. God's love is not exclusive with regard to race, or social status, or nationality, or economics. He will accept and call everybody to become a part of his family and be included but some people are not willing to accept his love. We talked about that in a sermon a few months ago uh, when we talked about the fact that Jesus admonishes us not to throw our pearls to pigs. That's Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do... They may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, we are to share the gospel. But when it becomes apparent that the gospel is not welcome, we are to move on. We are responsible to share the good news. We are not responsible for people's response to that news. We're to share the news. That's our responsibility. 
We are not responsible with how they respond. Leave that to God. People may go to hell unsaved, but they can never go unloved. God loves them. We can all be God's people, but we must be willing to respond to him because he's already made a commitment to us. John 3, 16 through 18. We know the scripture, but I'm going to read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Now, to show that he has committed himself to his people, God did not send a substitute to do what he had to do for himself. If God had just remained God the Father, he could not have touched us because our righteousness to him is as filthy rags. There's a scripture in Isaiah chapter 64, verses 5 through 7. And it says, You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We are all filled up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. So if God couldn't have just acted as God the Father because he hated sin and our righteousness was as sin is as filthy rags. If he had been only a man, he could not have saved us. So, he had to be both God and man. No substitute could take his place. It had to be God Almighty, who is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. To show his commitment to his people, he did it himself. Did not, did not send a substitute. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is, is a radiance, radiance of God's glory and exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to that. So God is God the Father and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, no substitute. He did it himself to show his commitment to us. He didn't send an angel to save his people either. The angels are messengers of God, and they move with his will and speak urgent words to his people. They can help us. But they could not die for the redemption of mankind. Angel couldn't do that. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you are mindful of, him, of them, a son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels, you crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. 
and put, putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the peace of God he might taste death for everyone. No, in verses 14 and 15 of that same chapter, Hebrews chapter 2, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared that he meant, somebody talking about Jesus, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all of their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. God did not send a substitute. He committed to you. That's why we can ask people to be committed to him. Or, where, or because you can decide yourself to be committed to him. A president of a nation or leader of a nation can send ambassadors to plead to speak for the country. Now, though these people may, can be highly effective, if the president himself or herself chooses to go, the whole world stands at attention. Now, we saw that a little bit last week when President Biden went abroad for meetings last week. So the point I'm making is, in order to be most effective to show true commitment, God had to do it himself. Just like a president, if he wants, he can't do ambassadors, say a lot of things, and they have a lot of power and influence, but when he says it, he commits the nation to it. That's the point. It is, is it any wonder then that when Christ or God, who gave himself, ask for our commitment, he wants us and not a substitute. He did not substitute. He wants us and not a substitute. Now, now you young people may, man, if you've, been, if you've just read some literature, you would know. You know the story of, the story of Miles Sanders, right? Uh, uh, who sent John Alden to Priscilla to ask for her hand in marriage. Remember that? He went, speaking for John Alden, uh, went for uh, Miles Standish. I'm sorry. John Alden was speaking for Miles Standish. Now, it's reported that she said, speak for yourself, John. So she gave her love to the one who came himself and not the substitute. You and not the substitute. God and not the substitute. God committed himself to us so that we can declare his praises. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We read this again. This time for me, NIV. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now that verse clearly says that God has chosen us so that we can declare the strong virtuous, and wonderful deeds of our Savior. God has chosen us to declare the strong, virtuous, and wonderful deeds of our Savior. So God's action of commitment had a purpose. He doesn't save us simply to count us, to just run up the numbers. He doesn't save us simply to do that. He calls us to be his people so that we may share aloud the glory of his deeds 
done on our behalf and to show the radiance of the light that has penetrated our darkness. Remember, we talked about that last week. We talked, we talked about the fact that God's light radiates through us and gives guidance to the world. So God saved us for a purpose so that we may declare the praises of his glorious deeds. Now, the deeds that we praise are, include, or not limited to, God's creation of the world and everything in it, the coming of Jesus, God's Son, our Savior, was born to save us from our sins, we declare, to declare the death and resurrection of Jesus, who is our hope of eternal life, we de to declare the building of a new people, a peculiar people, the church, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Those are the things we to declare, and we are also to declare the anticipation of the final act when Christ returns to call his people to the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. These are the things we are to de declare. This is why God chose us. Again, to declare God's creation of the world and everything in it, to declare the coming of Jesus, God's Son, who is our Savior, who was born to save us from our sins, to declare the death and resurrection of Jesus, who is the hope of eternal life, to declare the building of the church where God chose a people, we become a royal priesthood, a holy nation, where God's own people with us to declare that, and we are to declare the, that we, are, we anticipate the final act. When Jesus returns, there's a new heaven and a new earth, which is the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. That's what we're to declare. Now, when the power of this declaration sur surges through our hearts by the Holy Spirit, we are able then to witness to a cynical, dark world. We're able to do that because of the Holy Spirit that's in us. However, however, now, and we're peculiar people, the chosen nation, uh, royal priesthood, and that may tend for, to make us a little arrogant. Well, we're to make that bold declaration, though, with humility and with amazement. We cannot declare the glory of God's deeds or the radiance of his light if we draw circles around our own religious, racial, or economic groups. We must never, ever yield to the easy way of speaking and talking only to those people who are like us. We are to make this declaration, and God told us to that, right? God, made, God committed himself to us so that we can become a chosen people and declare those things, but even though we are God's chosen people, we are to be a humble, amazed people. God's commitment to us at Calvary, with it, he gave us the opportunity to become the children of God. He committed himself to us so that we could become his children and commit ourselves to him. John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, say this. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. 
He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Because God has committed himself fully to you, he can now call you, call us to commit our lives to him. That includes everything. That includes our abilities. That includes our time. That includes our talent. That includes our giving. He didn't hold anything back. He gave himself completely so that we might be his people. So we, we, because of his commitment, can commit ourselves completely to him. God calls us to commit ourselves to declare, remember, his wonderful deeds and his marvelous acts to a world in darkness. He has come, or he came, committed ourselves, himself to us, that we can go out. He loved us so that we could love. He gave to us so that we could give. Our commitment, therefore, is both a privilege and a responsibility. We have a privilege, yet we have a responsibility. So the question that remains for us is, will we permit God's commitment to us to shape the nature of our commitment to him? That's the question. We talked about God's commitment to us, which is hope. He did not substitute anyone. He wants us totally. No substitutes. Are we willing to commit us black selves to shape so that our commitment, by the way, let me get my words right. That are we willing to shape our commitment to him based on his commitment to us? And we're going to talk about this over the next few weeks. I wanted to start with the fact that God has committed himself to us. Now it's time for us to commit ourselves to him. We're going to talk about that over the next few weeks. Now also to those here and those uh, listening to us on Facebook Live or YouTube later, another question. Did you know that God's family, God's chosen people, are the, is the only family or the only group that's going to last for eternity? In a thousand years from today, if the earth is still here, there won't be a Microsoft, there won't be a Hollywood, there won't be any of the things that we use to today. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that even heaven and earth as we know them won't last forever. Because one day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. But there will always be a family of God. When everything is gone, when everybody else is gone, God's people, God's children will remain. If God's family, here's a question for you. We're not a member of that family. If God's family is the only thing that will last forever, don't you want to join it? You know, being part of God's family, the church has also all kinds of benefits. Being a part of God's family, you, uh, you, you will receive love, uh, you will, will receive instruction as how you can grow in biblical knowledge. It's a place where you can share your talents 
and you can benefit from the gifts and talents of everybody else. The joining a spiritual family will be one of the most significant things you could do with your life. Because the church, God's people, are making a difference in the world that's going to outlast your career, going to outlast your hobbies, it's going to outlast everything that you do. The question is, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? You can become one of God's chosen people today. How do you do that? There's a scripture that I uh, repeat every week, nearly every week, and it's Romans 10, verses 8 through 10, and verse 13. Here's how you become one of God's chosen people. Remember what I said. If you're God's, one of God's chosen people, he's made a commitment to you means he's responsible for you, responsible for taking care of you. He's promised you eternal life. He's promised that. And he's responsible because he's committed to you. Here's what it says, Romans 10, 8 through 10, and verse 13. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do that, and you will become one of God's chosen people. But don't do it in a vacuum. Let somebody know. Because remember what I said, God doesn't add to his family just to run the numbers up. 